but welcome everyone um, to Get Scouted's first webinar of 2021. And um, we hope that you guys are well. Um, and thank you ever so much for taking your time out. Um, I know a lot of you lot are probably in your half term. Um, so it's good to see that a lot of you are sort of keen to sort of find out um, what it takes to truly get scouted. Um, my name is Mohammed. Um, I'll be your host um, for this afternoon's webinar. Um, but we wouldn't be able to do this without our sort of key speakers. Um, so before we sort of get started, I just want to give you the rundown of today's session. Um, so we'll be going through the introduction um, where we'll sort of be introducing the speakers. Um, we're then shortly going to be followed up by the warm up um, speakers questions. We're then going to have a quick breakout room um, where we're going to sort of have a quick activity in there. Um, finally, you guys would have the ability um, to be able to have a live Q&A session. Um, and then finally, we're sort of gonna um, do the uh, quick wrap up. So this won't take more than an hour, um, but hopefully if you guys do have any questions, um, please do feel free to save that towards the end. Um, and when you guys do have your questions, put it into the, uh, into the chat um, and then we can go from there. Brilliant. So without further ado, um, Pete um, Bethel, um, one of the professional scouts here, um, I'm going to let you do your fun fact in a moment, um, but I know that you're currently a professional scout and um, you're the former head of recruitment um, at Colchester. Next person that we have in our panel um, is Lee Cowley. Um, he's another professional scout. Um, so Lee, would you be so kind to sort of um, give us a breakdown of your experience um, as a sort of academy head um, and your career as well? I'm very much similar to Pete. I started off in the coaching world uh, after playing in a reasonable level of non-league football, uh, St Albans and Letchworth, and then I jumped into uh, coaching when I, uh, mainly because I had a bad knee really, it started with a trauma crucia, so that's what got me into um, coaching. Uh, then I had a good friend of mine was the assistant manager at, at Luton at the time, Wayne Turner, so he brought me into the um, coaching world part-time with the academy, which was back in them days was called Centre of Excellence. Uh, and then stayed at the club for a good 10 years, then come out of it, went into non-league management, uh, first team levels at Dunstable Town and Olsey Town, then um, changed a shift of uh, personnel and head of coaching at, um, uh, at Luton come up. So I took that role. So I left and went back into the academy as head of coaching for um, a few years. And then three or four years ago, I uh, started to look at my age, thought, uh, how much do I keep running around demonstrating, um, doing stuff with some of the younger players and younger coaches? Because I'm now 60, 61. So I thought time might be to um, take a more of an analysis side of things. So I uh, took the job on. I become the first academy head of coaching, head of recruitment, sorry, at Luton Football Club, which I'm now been at the club now for five years doing that. So, um, and now, uh, the things going on as the club's progressed and interlocking with the first team. So it's been quite interesting to get to go and watch, do match reports and recruit for the academy predominantly and then help out as and when because we're a small club uh, on that side of things. So that's what, that's my my journey in, in a short conversation, yeah. really. Absolutely. No, thank you so much for sharing. And I know that, um, that you've attended um, quite a few of our um, events. Um, yeah. I've I had the pleasure of um, scouting a few players uh, who've actually attended. So would you be able to just give us a brief insight into um, how that sort of worked with you and, and, and give us a quick breakdown um, and a bit of insight to the players that are um, joining us in this afternoon's webinar? Um, well, what, come a look, uh, see, see what you're uh, from the sidelines. I mean, the, the couple of ones we've been to have been, the weather's been horrendous. So uh, yeah. um, so I looked on that initial video at the beginning there, everyone's umbrella was up and that was very much how it was on the game to watch and then we, we just look and I'm just initially looking uh, uh, especially on the younger players we look out try and pick out the best player and then as we get older it becomes more player specific what what we need at the club at that particular time uh, we were hoping to go into um, cat 2 uh, in the future so we're looking to recruit for 23s looking to recruit on the 18s if we can get some 18s in 16s is very much like player Pacific and then once you start getting down the younger age groups we look more at the best players and then hopefully we may change your position we may look to see what what um, other areas and other avenues you might use rather than player Pacific so that's in a nutshell that's really what we're looking at uh, at Luton 
Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Wow. No, thank you so much, brilliantly. Um, so next up, we have Mr. Russell Hobbs. Um, so just a quick insight into Russell. Um, he's a professional scout, um, but also specializes in video and analytics. Um, without taking too much time off of, uh, of yourself, Russell, um, would you be able to um, break down into, into your experience as well? Well, I'm like the other fellas. Um, I've never been full time. Uh, I've always had a job. I've always worked and uh, in and around a, a period of time. Um, when I was younger, I played a lot of football around East London. Then I had a period when I kind of had a job that I had to work nights. And from there, I only started getting back into football once my two boys started playing. I started coaching in youth football. Ended up being chairman of a big club in South End, um, where we ran about 30 teams, I think it was in the end, which always had to be graded um, and kind of scouted. And then someone I know approached Ross Embleton, who's now manager of Orient, and he was uh, an academy fellow at Norwich, and they were looking for an area scout. And I went in and met him and we had a chat and then I started doing reports for him. And just after about a season, they were going to give me another contract. And just before that, a fella had moved to Colchester and a chap there, Andy Scott was his name, asked me to come in there. And I ended up working for Colchester for about two or three years. Um, but mainly I ended up scouting players that were already in football academies that were likely to be released and their pathway was, was ending with that probably a cat one club yeah. and coaches that were always looking for players that were going to be let go. So unlike all the other scouts who kind of bailed out with about 20 minutes to go, I had to stay to the end of all the games to see who they were bringing on because that's the players that we will be looking at. That's who I've been reporting on. And then after a change at Colchester, where they changed the structure of the scouting, I was released from there. And then I was still coaching, and I'd always been in and around um, the academy scene with the cameras they were using. Kind of built my own camera uh, with, a, with various bits and pieces, and ended up at, now at Tilbury um, filming and analysing their home and away games but I've filmed a, 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 a number of non-league clubs for both companies and directly. So that's kind of how I, I've still been involved in football and I've still um, built a small business up servicing the non-league community. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Not quite experienced there. So I think we've um, we've managed to have the, the pleasure of having the internet from the experienced um, scouts. I think it's time to say hello to our football players the Taufi hello so Taufi um is uh sort of an experience as a as a centre back um but I think I think you, you and yourself and, and John Bill would be um a sort of a really good help in breaking down your experience your insight uh, sort of going for football. Um, so Taufi would you be able to say a quick hello and, and and sort of a bit about your experience and how you sort of made your way into uh, yeah um, no problem I started football from young, as, I, as you, we, we all do. Um, and I got scouted when I was 14. So I was kind of late to get scouted. Um, it was a bit of a weird one. I was at London Youth Games, um, played for Camden. And we, we, we did something that never was done before. We just went to the final and um, nearly won it. But we ended up losing to um, a team from Lewisham, Barra Lewisham, but it had like... Joe Gomez, Regan Charles Cook, Casey Palmer. So, like, of the generation, my generation, it was all like best footballers. They all played for, like, Arsenal, Charlton. And me, at the time, I was just playing football, school football. Yeah. So, obviously, um, from that game is when I got scouted. I had, like, QPR, Millwall, Leighton Orient, Dagenham, Redbridge. Long story short, I ended up signing for Dagenham and Redbridge because I was based in East London. Um, it was easier to get to. And then that's how it really started for me. Um. That's how when I got scouted and then from there, I didn't get my scholar at Dagenham and I entered something called the Nike Academy, which mm -hmm. was like a, um, it was a global academy. We like, we was a base at St. George's Park um, and we trained every day and to try to get a pro, professional contract. Um, 
Brilliant. Yeah, I ended up signing for Burnley. <laughs> and yeah, we was at, when I signed for Burnley, we was top of the champ. Their first team was top of the championship. My first season, they prom- got promoted and they went to the Premier League. So I was there for two years. Um, first year was championship, second year was Premier League, which was a really good experience to have at the time. Um, but yeah, for a young player, it probably wasn't the best time to go to a club, <laughs> but <laughs> it was a good time to be part of the part of the club at the same time. Excellent, excellent. So you're constant. Um, I know you're just as uh, as creative with your pen as you are on the pitch. Um, so would you be able to break down? Um, that that came from spoken word came from me. Um, just talk. It was like my. It was like a personal diary that I could share my own thoughts of yeah. like my background, my upbringing, with what I was going through with it, life or football. It was just like kind of an escape. So it was just something I I was taught to do from young, just to kind of like write write things down to help me escape. Because um, anybody that knows the football industry can is is tough mentally. So finding an escape was always needed. So yeah. Brilliant, brilliant. No, thank you so much for, uh, for sharing that. We're going to break down your uh, your insights soon, so uh, we'll come to you. Johnville, so we've got another, um, we've got the pleasure of meeting another um, talented player um, who's also had the experience of also going pro as well. Um, so, Johnville, I know you've had experience um, in this, sort of in a right-back position, but it'd be great yeah. to just break down your experience as well, um, and then we can sort of get started from there. Yeah, similar to Taufik, I started playing for my district. So obviously you play for your school, your district team. And actually from that, I got a trial at Arsenal when I was about nine, ten years old. Um, yeah. It didn't quite work out there, but um, I kept on going, kept on going. And I think, yeah, I was about 10, I think just going into secondary and I got scouted for Leighton Orient and sort of done a trial there um, and ended up getting signed. And I was there for four to five years yeah so I think someone mentioned Ross Emberton he was actually my coach at one point yeah um yeah so yeah I was there for quite a while and then sort of we mutually agreed that I would move on and then yeah I sort of moved to Stoke that was through a through an agent um and yeah I was after Stoke I sort of dropped into the non-league game um and trained with a couple clubs and yeah played in played in non-league since then Perfect. So you've got a bit of experience on the pitch. Um, yeah. You've also relayed into your fun fact. Um, so yeah. aside from your bicycle kick at Manchester City, um, yeah. you'll be able to uh, to break down um, your fun fact in the... Uh, yeah. In- yeah, the fun fact is actually I support Arsenal. So whenever I play Arsenal, like, or I've played against or I've been training there, it's always a big thing for me. So yeah, we was playing Arsenal and I think they had like, I think they had Arteta playing. They had um, they had a Wobi. They had they had a big team. Like a lot of the first team players that are usually injured, when yeah. they're coming back fit, they play they play for the under twenty threes. Yeah. So I actually didn't have my best game that game, but um, yeah, just one of the times Wilshere was near me, and I should have crunched him. But because <laughs> we all know Wilshere's, we know his problems with injuries and stuff like that. And I actually support Arsenal, so I sort of. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't win the ball. I should have. And that always, I always, that that always plays on my mind. But yeah, it's just a fun fact. But um, yeah, gave him the benefit it, of the doubt. Yeah, gave him the benefit <laughs> of the doubt. <laughs> Love. I would have done the same as well, being an Arsenal fan. But don't tell. Yeah. Tell my dad. Cool. So if we was to uh, to crack on, um, I think one thing I really want to do is just really just sort of ease into things. Um, I'm just gonna ask two or three, um, two or three questions that you guys. And then we're really then going to get into the uh, into the crux of the uh, of the questions. Um, so one thing I really wanted to um, to get an understanding of, and I think this is mainly directed at the, uh, at the scout. So please do feel free to uh, to sort of um, answer this, Lee and um, Pete and uh, Russell. Um, but is it true that only less than one percent of plays actually go pro then? And anyone can chime in, by the way. Yeah, I'm not sure that uh, percentage, but it is very low. Yeah, it's very low. So actually anyone getting signed at an academy or even representing uh, the under-18s has done a fantastic, you know, there's 64 million in the country. There's not many spaces. So uh, even representing an academy, you've, you've performed a miracle, really. But the percentage, I'm not sure the exact percentage at the moment, but... It is very low like that, yeah. Got you. And uh, and Lee, do you agree on that? On, on, on... Oh, 
100 percent agree that like just getting taken on as a cadre player is a small it's a start of your journey. Uh, yeah. getting then getting a professional contract and then playing 20 to 100 games in someone's first team is is, a, is another challenge in itself. So mm-hmm. just by getting an academy opportunity doesn't always necessarily mean to say you've arrived. I think sometimes the young players have got to realise they've got to keep working hard, keep improving and learning the game to get on to that next step. But it is a big achievement just to be in the academy, uh, in the academy of Ireland. Uh, I, I, I'm going to be honest, like my son was in that position where he didn't get taken on as an academy player. Uh, and that's just a fact, isn't it? because it is so difficult. It's so difficult. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Would, would you agree, Lee? Oh, sorry. Would you no. agree, Lee, that um, uh, it's a bit like when, when your children are leaving primary school, you look for the best school for them? Yeah. And I always say to people, as long as there's realism, if you're going to an academy, you should be playing with and against some of the best boys in the, in the country. You're getting a great education, free dietary and medical advice. Uh, you, you get your kit and, and on you go and you're looked after. If, if, if you take everything on board, it should enable you to become the best player you possibly can. And playing at non-league is, is where I played. Is, is is now the rewards are greater than when I played. Uh, so I, do, I, do, I, do, I do think some young players do underestimate um, the standard in Conference South, Conference North, Conference, I think there's some very, very good players. And also I look at a lot of players that have been released um, and then they go into like Hitching Towns level. Some of them, they can't always play the next level up because their jobs don't allow them to have the time to do it. And there's some very, very good players in and around that, that them levels that probably are as good as people in the conference, but their job commitments and financial uh, uh, benefits from them being part-time football, part-time uh, players is actually outweighs being a full-time footballer. Um, there's some good players. I've got, I, I watch my, my, my mates, the manager at Hitchin, I watch them quite regular. And there's some very, very it, it, good players in, in that. I think it's called the Central League, Southern Central League. There's some good players in there throughout the country. You, you see that with how well they do in the trophy and how well they do in the, in the FA Cups on these lower league clubs. Perfect, perfect. And I think this is a question that anyone can feel free to uh, ask about the, uh, about the speaker. Um, but is it true that you need to be connected to the scouting? Um, in order to be scouted or can you sort of get your way through trials? I mean, what's the, um, what are your thoughts on, on that front? Well, definitely... Oh, sorry. All, all I was going to say was, it, it going back even to that previous question, getting into an academy is, is getting into a trial at an academy, getting your foot in the door is very difficult. Um, as my experience, the, these two guys, Pete and Lee, are both decision makers. As a, as a scout working for someone like them, I had to convince them as my bosses that the kid or the boy or the man I was kind of trying to bring into the academy was going to compete with players already there. It's no good coming into an academy unless you can offer something that we don't already have. And I think that is often underestimated by parents and players as well. Obviously, the, the academies, uh, say, say you're an under 14, the academy will look at the under 12, 13 and 15 players in that position to see whether that player will be able to actually make any impact on the academy at all. So it's not just being in the academy or then going on, it's actually getting to get into the academy as a scout. I've, it's my reputation on the line if I recommend anybody, you know, I would have to recommend them strongly to come into the institution. Really? I, 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 to... Yeah, I don't think there's a sort of sometimes like getting into it is not hard and fast it because if you, if you've got enough hunger, enough desire, you'll you'll push other people out of the way. I think um, sometimes people that are already in academies get in comfort zones, and I think it's our jobs to make sure we keep bringing in people that to provoke different conversations and to challenge the people that are already in it. Because just because you're in that environment, don't mean to say you're the right person for that football club. It could be players, and you only got to look at London area. There's, there's such a dense population. To tap into every player is almost impossible. So some of them might rise to, to the top at later stages because of um, the support they get. 
uh, as in different, you know, different ways of getting there. But just because you're in it as a 12-year-old doesn't mean to say you're going to come through the other side. And, and if you have to go through the non-league way, and sometimes you look at the non-league ones, they've got more hunger and desire and they, they haven't had to put up with all uh, all the easy parts to get there. And they've had to work twice hard. So they sometimes actually do as well as some of the ones coming through it. So I don't think it's a hard and fast way, a you know, definite way of doing it. You're also, I think sometimes you've got to, You've got um, coaches biasness within the football club. We, we have coaches biases at our club, and just because they've known someone for ten years, they well, we've got to take him. And he's been here for ten years, and no, sometimes you have to challenge that as a as a scout and have these conversations to make sure that we're bringing in people to say, well, maybe is he the best player? We might have someone a little bit better. So, and that's why you have that turnover of academy, and that's why the first team sometimes. Academies don't produce as many players as they should because they're always looking for people outside them that are better than what we got. And that's the law of the jungle. Perfect, perfect. No, couldn't have asked for, uh, for better questions um, and answers, sorry. Um, so I really want to sort of get into the uh, into the actual crux of the actual webinar, um, which is the actual Q&A session. Um, so again, just want to thank the speakers again for joining us. Um, so I'm going to crack on with some of the questions um, I think would be a sort of a good, good sort of start off. Um, so, and this is mainly targeted towards the, uh, the scouts. Um, so what is it that you guys tend to look for in a player? Um, what is it that, that really ticks your, your, your sort of your checklist? What makes you think, right, this is the player that I think would be a good fit for the team? Um, what, what sort of decisions do you sort of make? Um, so what do you guys look for on that front? So if we could start off with Pete, then we'll go Lee and then we'll go Russell. Um, well, I, again, it's, it's different at almost every club I've worked at. But uh, like Lee said earlier, most clubs up until you know, youth development phase, it's just generic um, looking at their ability, uh, what it, what's their X factor, um, are they good 1v1, things like that. Um, but game intelligence is always a big thing for, for me when I'm looking at it. Uh, you know, don't expect a seven-year-old to have too much of that. But as they get through through the ages, they've got to start picking up on why I'm and, and where they do these things. So that's a massive thing. Uh, when you get to youth development phase, especially at the Cat 1 and the Cat 2 clubs, they, they are looking position specific because, you know, they won't block pathways. If they've got an England prospect at under 14 at left back, you're going to struggle to get a, 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 a decent player in even at the under 15s and 16s because of blocking pathways. But, um, I think the big thing for me is, is game intelligence. Um, lots of kids come in, they're raw, they've got raw ability, pace, strength, power, uh, but don't actually know where they should be on, on a football pitch. I always look, when you start up on a team, if you ask any kid, you, you play left back, where do you play on the pitch? They'll show you just sort of to the left of the penalty box. But a lot of kids have to pick up very quickly at academy level uh, where you need to be on the pitch in relation to the ball. Because if the ball's out right over the wide, wide right, you don't stay wide left. You tuck in and you get round and, and, and all that side, side of things comes into play then. So it starts with basically the basic of, of, of the football. Can you control it? Can Have you got vision? Are you a decent athlete? But as you get older everything changes and the perspective for me goes on game intelligence. Do they know where they've got to be on a football pitch? Perfect. Brilliant. And Lee, what are your, what are your thoughts if you were to add on to that? What is it that you look for um, specifically when you're trying to recruit for, uh, for Luton FC? Well, oh. quite a lot of that. Quite a lot of that. What Pete just said would be ditto for me. There's quite a lot of it that, that makes perfect sense. But I know from when I first started um, at the Luton Town Football Club, which was quite a long time ago, but and what I used to go out and watch games. My first thing I used to look for was technical, but now I uh, don't always look at that as being the most important thing. Uh, I, sometimes from the young players, I'm looking maybe the physical attributes that they may bring to the club and maybe can we coach them to be better, especially if we get them at early ages. So through um, all my coaching journey, as in doing my badges and doing the A licences and doing all them sort of stuff, youth development stuff, they're very much like on the... Um, or corner model, so really quite often I look down and break down the four corners, which 
is technical, tactical, physical, and psychological corners that we look at. And um, you know, you, you the best players will have all, be very, very good in all four corners. But to to go into an academy, if you've got really for me, if you've got two of them corners that you're very, very strong at, and couple that you can, we believe we can improve at, then you you stand a good chance of getting scouted on on that side of it. So the four corner model is very much something that through the years that I didn't even think about when I was first starting in my journey as a coach in the academy and stuff like that. But now through experience and through bad years and knowledge, I, I you do quite often use them uh, in my thinking when I'm looking at players. So four corner bit, I mean, if you were to ask me what do I think is the most important one out of all of them, I think probably long-term to be going to the right up to the very, very top, what you like psychologically, because I see loads and loads of technical players, loads of players like, as Pete said, that can run, and can, but they can't do it. But that psychological bit, can they deal with all the pressures and all the people around them and, all, and having all the criticism and, and all the pats on the backs and all the things that go with it? Maybe the psychological form is something that long-term, right at the death, could be the one that could make or break them. Because they can. we've got lots and lots of good players at Luton that, that technically... When you have training sessions, wonderful. But what can I like in front of 15,000, 20,000 people when the manager shouts them? So they're all, that's something that, that people we don't always consider to look at enough of, in my opinion. Perfect. Brilliant. No, thank you so much. And, and Ross, was there anything that you wanted to uh, to add on that? I know it's um, the last part of the... Yeah, <laughs> so, I, is, ready. I, I went out there as a job and, and often the first thing I would look for is when the player receives the ball, first of all, obviously, is he comfortable receiving the ball? But does he then some, make an impact? I also had a particular thing, does the player cop without the ball? Once you started looking and, and isolating a player that you took your eye, does he scan the pitch? Does he make himself available? Does he support his team? Does he support the play? Does he get himself in good positions to receive the ball again? Does he move the ball on quickly? Can he go past someone? Often the players that I would look at um, on grassroots level would be the outstanding player on the pitch. That Because they, it's very hard. There's a lot of good players, but someone's got to be outstanding for me to recommend them. And that can come in a number of ways, whether they go past players or they can deliver crosses accurately, whether they are fit and able to get them down the pitch from box to box, those type of things. So it would always be something impactful of which there is a, an array of skills, in, obviously, as a footballer. You're on mute. We can't You're on mute. mute. Typical. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so, Tafi, what's something um, underestimated at trials, would you say? Um, I think the hostility of the environment of the... Yeah, at the end of the day, when you go on a trial, you're coming to take someone's shirt. And people feel like when they go on trial, it's just going to be this friendly and nice environment. It's not. You've kind of got to make your stake, your claim from, I, I would say, from the first five minutes of the session. Any manager that's obviously you've had to go through the stages of they just mentioned of getting scouted, then the scout telling the boss to head of recruitment, yeah, I need, I want you to have a look at this player. You've now got to demonstrate what you're good at. So if I was to say to any um, child that when you go on a trial, demonstrate your strengths. If your strength is that you're very good at free kicks, then make sure there's a free kick, you take the free kick. If you're very dominant in the air, make that header look really well. Do you know what I mean? Because at the end of the day, you they might be nice and friendly, but it is cutthroat when you are coming through the academy system. It's it's not it's not nice. It, it, everybody wants to be a footballer, so you've got to go there and don't underestimate the fact that okay, oh well, I'm on trial, I'm wearing their kit. And it says trial list on it, and I can go take a picture in it. And nah, listen, when you're there, make sure you remember why you're there and what you want to do and take the opportunity because it, they don't always come. And football's a game of opinion. So that manager or coach that likes you, might not like your game there, will love you at another place and another manager. So when you're there, just demonstrate what you're good at. And if you carry on doing that enough times, it will stick. Do you know what I mean? There's certain managers that could never play with Jamie Vardy up top because they might want to play with a false nine, keep it in. But the cell managers, they need a Jamie Vardy who runs in behind, stretches the pitch 
And do you know what I mean? So you've got to understand to demonstrate your your strengths on the trial, basically. Perfect, perfect. And thank you ever so much. And, and Johnville, is there anything that you think you might want to add to, to that as well? It's typically often underestimated at these trials. Yeah, similar to T is about, for me, it's about adaptation as well. Like knowing what that club really wants and what, like, what they want in a player, for example, if a manager's looking for a fullback who just wants to clip it channels or he wants someone who's overlapping or he wants a target man, there's no point of you going to the club, do you know what I mean? And doing the complete opposite. Like, I feel like there's a lot of different identities in all the clubs. For example, like Arsenal like to play, another team will play long, do you know what I mean? So, yeah, I just feel like when you're going to a place, you need to identify how you're going to go, like what the manager wants to know, what, what the manager needs to see from you. So, you know, at the end of the day, you've given your all because at the end of the day, every manager is different. One manager um, would like what you're doing there, but another manager wouldn't want you to do that at his club, do you know what I mean? So it's just about, yeah, really knowing. And like what T said, um, yeah, just, just um, making what you do well stick out, really. Perfect, brilliant. Um, I think I think you you both made really good points on that, and I think that sort of leads on to onto my next question, which is what sort of research um should a player do um on a club before a trial? Um, so I think Russell, if, th- if this would be a, a sort of a good question for yourself, and 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 if P could go next, that'll be that'll be brilliant. So I missed the question. I lost connection. All right. So what 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 sort of research um should a player do on a uh, on a club? <laughs> Typically, what we tend to see is that different clubs have different playing styles. Um, and as um, Taufik and, and, and Johnville were kind enough to mention, that different managers and different coaches would be looking for different things. Um, but what, what kind of research can a player do on a trial to try and improve their chances of, of potentially being scouted? Can you hear me, by the way? Or Pete, would you be able to answer? I'm not. I'm not. I'm, I'm losing all connection there. I'm ever so sorry. Can you guys hear me okay, by the way, or is it? I can hear you. I, I, I can speak, mate. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's worth looking into where, where you're going. Obviously, it's very difficult for a really young player, but uh, you, you do need to know. When I worked at Reading and Millwall, um, Reading had a reputation of being good football inside, well organised. But whenever I took a Millwall team down there, they would not like a little bit of South London coming at them and they would fold. Uh, and Millwall were the opposite. We were considered growlers uh, and uh, not playing any football, but that wasn't the case. But actually, at both clubs, Eamon um, Dolan, who was the academy manager at uh, Reading, who sadly passed away at a young age, uh, probably the best person I've worked with in football, he used to hire coaches for specific reasons. And uh, I worked with the 12s and the 13s because I'm all about pass, pass, pass and and looking, trying to get them to play like Barcelona. Uh, uh, but uh, under 14s, he'd have Martin Cooley, who was an experienced pro centre-back, who used to teach them the other side of the game uh, for a year. So just because a club's got an ethos about it with the first team, it doesn't necessarily mean they're going to coach you that way. So how does a boy get to know about that? Well, the only way is by speaking to people that have played it with and against, I guess. But you need to be armed with these things. It's like what Johnny said, you know, <laughs> it's no good you going there and smashing it up, up the line every time if that club want you to play inside and get on the overlap and keep possession and play around at the back. So you have to do a bit of research to know and, and every little bit that you know about the environment you're going into is going to help you because you're armed with that fact. So yes, research is, is good. It's difficult. Depends on your age, I suppose. Yeah, I was going to say, could I add to that? Exactly yeah. what um, I think Pete said about um, the age factor is massive. The younger you are, um, it's probably easier to adapt and you can, I don't know, you can ask your friend. And I feel like usually in this country, we, we like to play out from the back. I don't know many clubs at younger levels that don't try and pass out from the back and play through the lines, get the four on the turn, half turn and pass it forward. But um, I feel like when you get to the ages, when you get a bit older, like when I was trying to get into the first team, 
it becomes different. It's like understanding that this is a way that they play and you have to fit that DNA or you ain't playing in that, in that system. So it's kind of like understanding that it's important to do research and talk to players so you don't waste your time and the manager's time because manager will have that opinion of you but you just didn't fit their DNA. So don't let that happen. I feel that research is important and in, in, in any aspect of life, so especially in football. Perfect. Brilliant. Brilliant. No, I think you. one thing I think one thing you might be able to consider if you've got an, an agent, they might be able to find out the player profile that they want because a lot of clubs will put player profile for um, their first team heavily. They will have that type of player, what they expect. And it may be something if, you, if an agent's approaching that club, you, you find out what the player profile is for that set position. Just a thought, really. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it, anyway, most of the games are on TV now. You can watch the first, most first teams at some point anyway, especially the championship and the premiership. That's it. That's it. That's it. So, John Hill, um, when you when you first sort of gone pro, um, what was the sort of the, the biggest change that you saw um, when you sort of transitioned from lower league clubs? Um, it was... Yeah, it was massive. I won't, I'm not gonna lie. When obviously Leighton Orient still a massive club, so like when there was I was I was there when they was in the League One, and the, I think I left the season. They actually lost in the player finals. So yeah, Leighton, Leighton Orient's fortunes could be that like, it could have been very different. But um, yeah, when you go there, it's just everything in terms of the the technology, like the um, how upgraded everything is. Everything's more in depth, like like stats. Everything is looked at from your heart rate to to on the pitch, every pass, every every sprint, every everything, even in training, everything was monitored. And like for me, just being a boy from London, like when I when I went there, it was a bit of like the first one of the first person I saw was Michael Owen. Like I went, I went to the first team canteen, I opened the door and I saw Michael, Michael Owen was like, You're right, dad. And I, <laughs> I, I just I, I didn't know what to say that like I was gobsmacked because like the someone I've watched on TV. Do you know what I mean? The countless, countless amount of times. But yeah, just in terms of the, the stature of everything and the people you're around and who you're seeing, yeah, it's, it's just it's, it's massive. It's, it's definitely one of the best, one of the best things you can do in this life, to be fair. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And Tom, I think is there anything that you want to add on to there as well in terms of seeing the, the transition and the difference sort of going from the lower league clubs to sort of playing at the bigger clubs and, and, and from that? What was the sort of the changes that you saw? Um, uh, the professionalism is the, the main thing um yeah. obviously now unfortunately being back in i say unfortunately but being back in league or like going to non-league just the professionalism of like the drive of like premier league players so like like johnville said the first one of my first weeks i remember paul robertson um he was like the second third choice keeper he had tom heaton got joey barton and like just seeing them like train and play and just the attitude they have like actually ones like towards football was like a completely like different eye opener like you thought that yeah I want to be a footballer and then you actually saw footballers and and how good they are at the basics. Yeah. <laughs> like, it goes so underestimated like the, the basics, the things we take for granted, they're just so good at the basics. It never goes wrong. Um, rarely obviously of a human but um, just that professionalism just the just the attitude towards being a footballer and how they nutritioned and the timekeeping and just everything was so much different to then obviously being a non-league and yeah it's, it's a lot yeah it's a big big difference yeah yeah no I can I can tell and I, I know it must have been a sort of an exciting sort of feel in and sort of just having that ability to go from so sort of lower league to pro um, and bumping into people that would have been your childhood idols. Um, so that I'm um, I'm super jealous of you guys on that front. Um, <laughs> with um, with Russell, um, I'm gonna come back to you if that's okay. Yeah. Um, what I would love to uh, to find out is, um, of course, when plays the ten trials, there are footages that are recorded um, that would be sent off to different clubs and different teams. Um, but what's your insight in terms of how footages are analysed and how they're often scored? Um, and what clubs would tend to sort of go through in there and then analyse it? I, I know from, um, I used to go an awful lot to South End because it's just up the road to me. And I kind of got to know the analysts there. And they filmed 
virtually all the all the all the first team had all their um, first team training field, and due to down the leagues, it was due to availability of analysts and cameramen to do it for them. But I think on most Sundays when the youth sides played, every game which there be might be four going on on a Sunday was filmed and broken down, and for various age groups different um, solutions, different usage was made of, of the film. The further up you went, individual player clips were able to be broken down and shown to their players during the course of that working week. Um, for the youth, for the younger players, I think it was more just patterns of play and how they'd been, um, how, the, how the game had evolved for them. Where I'm working at, at Tilbury, we break, we use it to break down all our offensive and defensive thirds, our free kicks, all set pieces, all set plays. And we they use that, the coaching staff use that not only to um, draw out data from it, but also to demonstrate to players in a much shortened fashion because of the, the times they get to connect with those players. Uh, what had happened and, and how they want to go forward. And they bring up examples of what they want to see and what they don't want to see. But in terms of individual scoring, I've, I've never done that. I, I've just used it as a, as a tool to improve rather than to detract. Got you. Perfect. No, thank you ever so much for that. Um, Lee, I would love to get your insight into um, and how important goal scorers are within a game. Um, and as you can imagine, scoring goals is probably the most important part of, 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 uh, of a game. Um, but a lot of people from strikers all the way to defenders at trials want to make sure that they were scoring to try to sort of impress the scouts. Um, is that something that, that, that typically tends to impress your, yourself or... or, or is it something that well, I think I think it's what Pete alluded to before when he said about influencing the game. When you that is something that influences the game. I mean, if you had two people that were, had the same ability on the ball, and one was uh, a Frank Lampard scoring a load of goals, and then and you and you as an individual weren't scoring a load of goals, Frank Lampard would be the one getting picked all the time, and he could have probably an average game. You could actually be better than him. At certain times in the game, but you'll be the one that'll be left out if it comes to push come to shove because they can guarantee goals. Same with centre forwards. If you score lots and lots of goals, you can be average and don't play particularly well in games and score score goals that win your team the game and get your three points and get the bonuses and everything. Everyone's happy about it and the crowd love you. Yeah. That's just a simple fact. And also, you only got to look at someone like centre halves. You go back to John Terry scoring all them goals. It's important. Because you, you know, as a centre half, you could be effective in both boxes. One is heading the ball out, but also scoring a few goals with your your power in the air, or your, you know, your aggressive side. You're in, in the opposition penalty box, which becomes really, really important. And I think everyone sort of like looks at looks at that as as the prime example, and that's where all the money is. If you were scoring yeah. all the goals, Harry Kane scoring all the goals every time he plays, Tottenham look like they might win a game. You know what I mean? And that's just a simple fact. So when he's fit, he plays. Simple as. That's it. No, it's, it's an important part of the aspect of the game. Probably the most important. Yeah, brilliant. No, thank you so much. Um, so those of you that are thinking of sort of attending the trials, you know what sort of things that the, the, the scouts are going to be looking for is going to be impacting the in a game. Um, but Pete, I think I think one question that I would love to sort of poke at you is um, looking at things around mentality. Um, I think a lot of players often underestimate how important um, you're sort of being watched right from the beginning. Um, and I think Taufik was kind enough to mention this from the beginning that a lot of the time players are sort of just expecting that they'll be sort of watched the moment that they step onto the pitch. Um, but how important is um, areas such as mentality, um, both on and off the pitch? It's, it's very important. Um, the, the, the kids all go on about they want to play for a pro club and they forget that pro is an abbreviation of professional. So to me, from the word go, you've got to act in a professional manner. Um, and there's a saying I use all the time, that you only get one chance to make a first impression. And uh, I say to kids all the time, don't be that boy that's turning up late, running onto the pitch when the warm-up started, doing your boot laces up when the game's about to be kicking off, you haven't got your shin pads. All them little things count. 
I've been a lazy academy coach. I don't want problems. If a kid's consistently, they have lots of problems, especially in London, getting across London after school, getting to training. But there are things that are taken into consideration. So use that as an example. You know, it's difficult sometimes, but people don't take that into account. You've got to be professional all the time. It's, again, even during the game. When, when, when I've done player reporting, it's really difficult to go to Welling versus Dover and do a report on a centre-back because you don't watch the game. You watch the centre-back because 86% of the time he's not on the ball. So you need to know what he does with and without the ball. So even in at youth level, uh, uh, grassroots, you've got to be professional on your job. I like a good communicator things like that. It's all about professional behaviour. Don't be criticising people, encourage people. So, yeah, it, it, attitude is everything. Gentleman just mentioned John Terry. He's obviously a very, very good footballer, but he wasn't renowned as a, a Messi, he, but he made himself a millionaire because he put his head on the line and he's very professional. He made himself the best player he possibly could be. Uh, even though he started as a forward, I believe, uh, in East London with Ledley King in the same team. Um, but, you know, you've, you've got to be professional. John Terry was a one-club man almost, and he, he, he was so professional, it made him stand out, even though he wasn't considered to have great technical ability. But he was a, a probably a, a great pro to work with and a great pro for the kids at that club to watch. Uh, yeah. Oh, was someone going to add on something? Or um, so what I was going to um, do with now is I think I think that was extremely helpful. Sort of quick questions that I also wanted to ask you guys. Um, let me know once you guys can uh, can see my screen. Um, so I think from what we've learned today, I think the number of things that you can sort of apply into your um, into your sort of career from an early age, um, sort of keep in mind is be prepared and do your research. I think that's absolutely key. Um, have the right attitude and character. Um, that's on the sort of areas around mentality um, and also reflection and improvement. So any trial that you go to, feel free to use it as a lesson. Um, one areas that you can feel that you can work on um, and consistently and constantly to work towards improving yourself. And I think these are key aspects that the, uh, that the scouts and, and players were able to touch on today. Um, I just want to say a big thank you to the speakers on the, on the panel that have joined us today. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure having you guys on board um, and really being able to take your time out of your busy day to be able to give um, the young players the insight that they need. Uh, so thank you ever so much. And to the players that have joined us, um, thank you ever so much for, for joining us this afternoon. I really hope that it was of benefit and of value for everyone. Um, we are going to be doing a number of trials um, throughout April. And so we are back. Um, which is some good news. Um, so on April the 6th, um, uh, for the ages of 10 to 12, we've only got six spaces left, um, but we've got a few more other dates that you guys can be joining from April the 7th in London, April the 9th in Birmingham, April the 12th in London, April the 14th in London again, and finally on April the 16th. And you'll be able to find all of these dates on our website, um, and also feel free to visit our social media pages which you can find down here. Um, also want to give a big shout out to Taufik as well. Um, he's also got his YouTube channel. Um, he does some really good work in terms of a day in the life of Taufik. Um, he, you know, sort of give an insight into sort of how his professional football works. Um, all the way from his training sessions to his matches to his hydrotherapy sessions, um, which, uh, which should be able to give you an insight into the work that he does. So please do feel free to visit um, Taufik Olamwenwe um, on YouTube. And please, if you do have any questions, do feel free to visit info at .uk, um, as well as our website. But thank you ever so much. And uh, Mohammed, I've got a question for you, actually. Um, just before we wrap up, um, do you want to just send me a quick email or do you want me to send? I know. I'll reach out to you. I'll give you a quick call. Oh, okay, thank you. No worries. Take care, everyone. Cheers. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.